encryption, the security, stuff like that, what I've been thinking and what others have been thinking. And also, well, like Pierre said something about snake oil in the email security, I will show you one way to do that kind of snake oil <laughs> if you want to. And then there's probably going to be time for a lot of questions about anything you want to know about that. Uh, so, the first thing, what is Dumbcut? It started really as a IMAP server was completely designed to be as uh, as great IMAP server as possible, ma 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 as high performance and easy to use and so on. So then people also started asking for new features like factory server and then there was also mail delivery, LMTPC, scripting and stuff like that. For a long time I wasn't planning on implementing anything related to SMTP server, uh, but then it started, I don't know, uh, SMTP submission server. This was kind of a useful addition. It, it's practically already implemented at least the basics uh, because, well, there's these several reasons, like for example, there's the Lemonade mobile extensions that are not currently in any other SMTP server. So our SMTP submission server will support those Lemonade extensions that support things like, uh, so that you only need to send, e upload email once and you can then uh, upload once to IMAP and then for the SMTP su submission you can just kind of tell the SMTP server to fetch the email from your IMAP send folder and send it to the recipient. So uh, stuff like that. But then also I started thinking about MTA, full MTA maybe, I don't know. Uh, yesterday I sent an email to Delta mailing list and some people were thinking, Great idea, and others where well, don't waste your time on that, so I don't know yet what will happen. History, uh, is 11 years old. Uh, started when I was working for a small company, we needed an IMAP server. Um, <coughs> I was the only kind of sysadmin at that time in, in that small company, and I think programmers might not be very good sysadmins. Like sysadmins, maybe they look at what the software does and can I use it and so on. But I, when I have to, have to install something, I immediately look at the code. And then I start looking at the uh, Cyrus code, courier code and other code. And then I was thinking, no, this is horrible. I can't use any of this software. I, I need to write my own. Uh, that's kind of how it started, I guess. Then at some point, Stefan Bosch came and suddenly wrote Pigeon whole sieve from scratch. Before that, there was uh, Dalka was using the Cyrus sieve, which I didn't like at all. And then Stefan Bosch came and started. I don't know why he seemed to think it's really fun developing that uh, sieve stuff. Um, then after some at some point, or yeah, in the beginning, I was mostly writing it just for fun and on my free time, and I was working for other companies. And then at some point. More and more companies wanted to pay for some new features, and then at some point I went to work for a couple of uh, companies like Rackspace in the US. I was working for one year, and then went to Portugal and worked, worked for Portugal Telecom for half a year, and then I came to England, and then I had no idea what I'm going to do now. And at that, time, that point of time, there wasn't really that many companies anymore who wanted to pay for new features. Uh, so then I finally decided, okay, maybe I'll just create a Dunkin' company and see if it works out. And like Monty was talking uh, in the morning, oh, morning, morning. Uh, it's kind of difficult to get money out of uh, open source projects. And in the beginning, it was really difficult for us. Well, of course, support on consulting, but you know, that's not really, I think, Doing only support and consulting would have got me personally enough money to kind of maybe live, but it would have been only me in that company and couldn't, couldn't have hired other people. So now our company has all kinds of other things, but I don't think that's so important or interesting. Yes, I like these statistics from Debian's popcorn shows Courier Peak. This time, <coughs> something going down. Uh, Cyrus also going down. Delta going up. Then also we did this uh, uh, in 
internet scanning thing checked how, how much is the dark cuts. I thought maybe there's some like 20% of dark cuts and so on, but yeah, surprisingly much dark cuts. Mm. Of course, this doesn't mean completely that dark cut has 54% of all the users. I mean, this just looks at the IP addresses. And of course, a lot of exchanges are not in the public uh, internet. So I'm sure exchange is several times higher also. Yeah. Okay, so why do people like Dark? Um, when I first implemented it, I kind of did it wrong. I kind of optimized for memory usage, but it's really disk I.O. that's mainly the problem, at least in bigger installations. Docker is also anyway nice. It works really nicely for a small amount of users. If you just want to have your own Docker server with one user, it works great for it. It's, it's not going to use a lot of memory or anything. And it's easy to install and so on. So, for example, <coughs> my uh, personal emails, they run in my friend's server in my home directory. So it doesn't necessarily even require root access or anything. And, but then, then again, Dalkat can also scale to millions and millions of users. Um, the biggest one I know of has something like 22 million users. Uh, and yeah. So, because of that, Dalkat of course has to be really configurable for, because lots of different companies want all kinds of weird features and things to work in strange ways and it's kind of strange that IMAP is supposed to be somewhat simple that you just uh, save messages and you send them or the clients retrieve the messages. How hard can it be? But surprisingly it's difficult. Uh, so most of Dalkat or all of Dalkat code is really modular so you can write plugins and the plugins can do pretty much anything you would even want ever. They can add new IMAP commands and they can uh, extend uh, existing commands. Like for example, uh, ACLs are completely implemented as a plugin. Then there's things like the compressed emails as a plugin. Uh, authentication plugins, there's Dark has tons of ways to authenticate users from SQLL, whatever. And plugins you could authenticate against HTTP servers or whatever. Uh, so also, I, I really tried to make Dalkat super easy to use so that you just once install it, it and then it works there all the time. Even if there's some problems like, well, hopefully normally file system won't get corrupted, but sometimes if you have a little bit of corruption then Dalkat will just automatically fix everything it can without, instead of like completely failing and giving an error message, this is broken, do something, I'm not going to do anything more anymore. Uh, so yeah, Dalkat tries to automate everything, all the fixing, and the error messages are really nice. I've made it, I've tried to make it so that there's no error messages ever that uh, are kind of pointless. I mean, if you see an error message, it really is some error. You really should do something about it. Might be a downcut bug or might be uh, something on your system that you should be changing. And the error messages should be really understandable. I mean, for downcut mailing list for a long time, people were sending all kinds of error messages about what's what the problem was, but I don't really want to, I mean, I try to minimize my email, the number of emails I have to reply to. So the way to minimize my, my email replies is by making the error messages so easy that the people using Dalkat, uh, so that they don't even send me the email, the error message should be as so easy that they will know how to fix the problem instead of sending an email to Dalkat mail. Uh, there, was, there have been some cases like, I think I have, uh, right, 
there was one error message, for example, and the guy copies, copy pastes the email, sends it to me, and then I'm wondering how can I improve this error message so that he wouldn't send it. I can't really think of anything. So I just, from his email, I reply to it, I copy and paste a part of the error message and reply it. He only that copy pasted part of the error message and he replies back that thank you, okay. <laughs> <laughs> the error message told what to do, but he just, I don't know, didn't read it or something. Uh, Daukat is very integrated in the postfix. I like postfix, especially because postfix code is really nice. I'm kind of afraid of exing the code. It's scary, scary looking. So that's why I like postfix more. And that's why there's all kinds of these services that uh, Daukat implements that are kind of integrated into postfix. Like nowadays, it's not required for postfix to know anything about the users that exist in the system. Postfix can just do the user lookups through Daukat. And there's also things like if you want to have quota, uh, like if you want the, the SNTP RCPP2 command to fail when the user is over quota, you can do that kind of a policy server to postfix and which um, asks it from Daukat. And Daukat knows if it's over quota or not and then replies back. Yeah, so the, pretty much the only things that need to be configured in postfix are domains and email addresses. Okay, I already talked about login. Yeah, uh, right. Now I was thinking about showing you a nice demo. Uh, this, the intention is to so, show that even if you don't really know anything about Daukat, it is possible to install it in a few minutes, especially using this script. Uh, this script is install, installing it into Amazon, but the script is easily modifiable. You can install it into your own server, server or wherever uh, you want. Let's see. I think I need Only thing is you really need <coughs> to configure is the domain. I'm using this RNA domain, which is kind of like a test domain. Then we have an uh, administrator user so that because all the root emails and all the postmaster and postmaster and whatever aliases, they get sent to this user. And then we have passwords. We have TSS user password. And of course, you can have tons of uh, usernames, and of course, the passwords shouldn't be in plain text, but hashed in some way. There's Kafka can support all kinds of different password hashes. So, I don't know, let's see what happens with these two configurations. And of course, there's the Amazon uh, configuration, I mean, the secret key, so that it installs it into my account. going to take a little bit of time. So I put this thing if you want to look at it to here. And yeah, there's the power bar you can also look at. And after this installation of course you have to have a DNS you need to also modify DNS records. There's, it includes these couple of Daukat configuration and Postfix configuration, example configurations that you can easily use in whatever your own setup. Then it does all kinds of installation stuff.
yeah, the only things it's really needing is the password file, the way to authenticate, uh, way to authenticate the users, and of course it really should have an SSL certificate and DM, but those are also free to get from, for example, star SSL. And the postfix, you only need the domain, and it looks up users from the dubcup, and then there's the edit aliases, and simple things. Anyone should be able to install. Now it's done. I think I should be able to access the mail account. Then the next step, replication is also kind of interesting, I think. Uh, Desync based replication. So now yeah, that you have your one email server installed, uh, then you kind of, you, uh, it would be nice if you don't have to trust that email server to be up all the time. Like if you want it, it would be nice if you can just buy a couple of really cheap uh, virtual servers from some different hosting providers, and even if they don't give you very big uptime uh, promises, as long as one of the two servers works, you should be able to read and write all your emails. SMTP servers are kind of simple to replicate because well, they don't really need to replicate anything. You can just put two SMTP servers and they handle everything nicely. But with IMAP or email in general, you have all things like message flags and if you delete one mail, it should be deleted from the other side and so on. So with desync based replication, it's really simple to create this kind of a replicated setup. Just put two server servers wherever, configure desync replication. It's explained in, explained in the wiki. Uh, the replication can be done using it or I mean, through SSH or some TCP connection with some SSL security. And the nice thing, the way this works, is it's kind of high level replication. It doesn't matter what the lower lower levels here are. Like this could be using MailDir and this could be using MDBox format or whatever. It also doesn't it also means that if this file system breaks, for example, we have our company emails, they are also desync replicated and I'm developing all the time and I'm all the time when I'm when I'm developing I'm deleting these test mail directories and so on. So at some point I accidentally kind of deleted all my emails from my work <laughs> server. But then desync just comes and notices oops looks like the mails are lost and it just replicated them back automatically without doing anything. So it's nice. Uh, okay, that's, I guess, all about Dalcat introduction stuff. We can <laughs> talk about that later if you want. Um, uh, right, yeah, I really like this <laughs> quote. Uh, I am one of those guys who is implementing yet another, or thinking about post-prism emails. Uh, there's several different kind of layers. It's well, yeah, you can, of course, store emails encrypted. There's no problem with that. Uh, and IMAP, the email clients, when they are talking to IMAP server or SMTP submission, they uh, pretty much always, or at least it's very easy to just configure SSL and it works. But it's surprisingly difficult to configure two SMTP servers to talk to each other using, S using SSL. Here's some, yeah, it should be able to just, they should be using SSL, TLS, TLS, why? But why aren't they? I don't, I'm not really an admin, so I'm not sure completely, but what I've heard is uh, that 
a lot of uh, a lot of installations don't even have it enabled. I know that Hotmail doesn't support SSL. At least Gmail does, and does so that's good. But there are still big providers that don't even support it. And then apparently, I think was it some exchanges that uh, that advertise that yes, I support Start TLS, but if you actually try to use it, then it just completely breaks. Um, so annoying problems. There's this Dane is kind of nice. I like Dane. Uh, I especially don't like SSL stuff usually because of certificate authorities. I really don't. I mean, with CAs I have to trust one of the hundreds of different random companies and anyone can create whatever certificates. So that's horrible. But with this, this Dane TLSA records means that I put the uh, public key fingerprint to DNS, to my own DNS, and if the DNS is especially, especially DNS secure, <coughs> then there's, uh, if the, then the certificate, it doesn't even have to be signed by any CS. You can use self-signed certificates, and the security comes from DNS sec. Of course, you still have to trust the government or whatever that handles the DNS sec. Uh, trust anchors or something. So then there's also this one specification. Uh, Google started this idea, or some people in Google, the way that when you are sending, sending an email from your client, you could have a, like this send securely flag. And if you click that, then the sender kind of thinks that, or sender can be guaranteed that the email will never go over plain text on its way to the recipient. So if there's, if there's uh, the email goes to the first SMTP server with this extension, and then it notices that, OK, I can't, I can't send it to the next SMTP server uh, because it doesn't support SSL, then the uh, email is simply just bounced back to the sender that it can't be sent securely. I think that's might be useful, useful way for at least so that NSA can track the can catch the email while it's um, on the network. NSA and en encryption is kind of nice and SMIM I think it's really well supported, but it's kind of difficult if you try to send me an SMIM email. You would have to find my public key from somewhere. Who knows where they are? Actually, I don't even have one. But uh, it would be nice if there was some way for people to find those as my public keys. Of course, that already exists for PGP. There's the, all kinds of PGP, those key servers. Uh, but PGP, well, mail file apparently will make it easier to use. I don't know. Let's see. But it seems that web of trust is, is kind of difficult for people to actually use. But I have also been thinking, OK, maybe the web of trust might be useful for server certificates. Uh, so if I don't trust VNSSEC and I don't trust any CAs, but what if I trust, I specify that uh, let's all email server providers, let's sign our keys. Uh, server keys with each other, and then I think that, okay, I will trust this Dowcat company and this uh, Finnish ISP, and the, based on that, they can maybe clients could be showing that, yes, uh, this server certificate is signed by these two trusted authorities. So that might be something interesting. I'm not really. I mean, of course, if you have your own trusted webmail, then everything is great. Or if you really trust the webmail company, then that's good. But if 
you don't, then there's, I don't know, there's not a whole lot of point sending encrypted emails when the uh, web, when the webmail, people running the webmail, they can still access your encrypted emails if your private key is in the server side. And I know there's some, uh, some webmails where the people were saying that, okay, I will never, we will never even have your private key. We just use this JavaScript stuff that uh, the key, key is only stored locally in your system. But of course, they can just as easily just modify the JavaScript to read your local key when needed and uh, read your encrypted emails that way. So that's kind of bad. And yeah, that's why you really need to you are sending encrypted emails, you really need to trust all the software that is accessing the emails. Then one thing I've been thinking about is, do I even actually want to, like, if it now was possible to send, uh, send use, for example, PGP to send email to everyone and everyone could be reading a PGP emails, fine. Would I still even really even want to do that? Uh, because Things like searching usually doesn't work. I mean, I guess, yeah, sure, it's probably possible to still decrypt the, decrypt the emails and then save them into the search index to make searching fast. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. With uh, GPG, actually, all the headers on the email are not encrypted. So you can do search over headers, but not over contents. Yeah. And I think it's the same as with SMIME. So it yeah. depends on which deepness of search you want to do. Yeah. Yeah. So searching is annoying. And but yeah, maybe you, you can I guess in theory at least uh, you can put uh, put them in the search index yeah. index, but then your search index will show all the secret data in there unless you also enter. Ac the actually index. just just briefly, oh, so, sorry, but yeah. um, so we've thought about this as well, um, and um, Katie Pym, in fact, um, currently I think it's not working because it's nowhere used actively, but we've already had a uh, proof of concept implementation working where the um, actual search index was encrypted with the same key that um, was used to um, encrypt the actual messages, and it would only, on, on a set per session basis, um, as you are sitting in front of the computer and ideally you would configure your system so that when you say get up and lock the screen or something it completely locks it all down again but um, that it would only decrypt the search index for when you are actively working and searching through those emails and otherwise keep it locked up. Yeah, and even if you do this then the problem is if you do this for, do this for example in your phone then that means your phone has to download all your emails and index all your emails into your local phone, I guess. Unless you now create something uh, that can put the search index encrypted back to your server so that multiple devices don't have each have to download all your emails and index them to local index, but they could share some encrypted index. That might be useful, but I... Guess, guess what we're thinking about. Okay. Mm. Yeah, that would be nice. But still, uh, a friend of mine was talking about having this idea of using two crypto keys. Like, for example, he would want that, okay, maybe if I'm emailing some random people, I could be still encrypting everything. But it's, uh, then there would be the other one, like if I wanted to have my bank sending me some secret banking documents or something, that could have kind of more security, like with this normal security, I could maybe trust my normal security PGP key to my whatever random webmail uh, that would have all the searches and everything available, but for those actually secret documents that I don't really even want searchable easily, then those could be using a different key. And then it could be that the sender could decide which one to use. Question? Uh, yes, it's about uh, searching the key encryption. Uh, I'm wondering, couldn't you just encrypt its worth with a key that is only known to the user? And uh, then you set, send the worth encrypted by that key to the search engine instead of uh, 
while trying to do the index in, two, in other ways. That way you could get uh, an encrypted uh, index where the only information that the uh, target that can derive is the frequency of different words, but without knowing which word is it, which. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you were thinking actually encrypting the words, but not mm. like the index. Yeah, but yeah, like uh, Gerd was, I think, telling some idea about encry uh, encrypting the whole index, so it wouldn't even know those frequencies mm. of the words or anything, I think. But yeah. I was going to respond to that. I kind of wanted to continue with talk. Um, I mean, the issue there is you will be re revealing a lot of side channel information. Uh, depending on how you do the hashing, it may be possible for an attacker to still query whether you have specific terms in your index. But for that, he will need to know and the term and which the is the will also point. reveal message structure. It will reveal which messages correlate to each other via some related mm -hmm. content. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of different ways that you can do statistical analysis on the index if it's hashed this way. And I know this because that's what I'm doing in MailPilot at the moment, and the, guy, the person that did our security audit has told me to mm -hmm. please stop doing that. <laughs> <laughs> snake oil thing, um, but several, surprisingly many people have been asking this. They want, the idea is that they want to kind of, so that all the users have uh, PGP keys and the emails are stored on the disk uh, so that it goes through GPG encryption and when, and then the server would also have the private keys for the user except the private keys are encrypted by the user's password, so that when the user logs in, they um, downcut catches the uh, catches the password and decrypts the encryption key, so that it's able to send the users. So, but yeah, so that it's able to decrypt the emails. But yeah, I don't know. It, it doesn't seem like like I think yeah, that's what the lava bit and the silent circle I think did. Uh, but I don't know. Is it really worth the trouble compared to simple symmetric encryption? One, like if the idea is that if the uh, hard drives accidentally get stolen or lost or something, so that you can get access to the access to the data, then for that symmetric encryption would be just fine. <laughs> Level security, isn't it easier to have different email addresses uh, plus extra secure or stuff like that and have those encrypted with the bank but you can give them other addresses to other ones? Yeah, I think with the bank thing, the problem was something like I don't know actually about other countries. I Apparently in Finland it's kind of illegal for the banks to send you unless it, they can unless they are sure that it's encrypted. And with current email, I don't think it's really possible for them to know if, if you have given your PGP keys to the web, web, uh, web mail or if it's really your own private key. So that's why I was thinking maybe if there was a way for them to really know that the set, uh, recipient from the recipient address or based on that somehow you can know that, yes, now I can really send securely and nobody else has any possible way of seeing it. What's your thought of developing uh, secure services in software? Was like in what level? Secure? Uh, what coding or yeah. strategies for coding? Methodologies for. Well, Dalgat is written using C language, and which is not really the not the, not the easiest language to write secure code in. But 
because of, well, I would actually want to change to some other language at some point in time, but it still seems like the type of software that Dalkat is, it's kind of, C is really well suited for that, to be very, still very efficient and so on. But yeah, in Dalkat I have written many different, uh, these libraries or APIs to make, so that it, yeah, the Dalkat libraries make it possible to write secure C code pretty easily, so that when I usually look at some other people's C code, I, I mean, it's so difficult to do anything. But with Dumpcat libraries, it's easy to do everything. And because everything is easy to do, and especially easy to do securely, or difficult to do insecurely, Dumpcat really hasn't had any uh, bugs that are caused by C code. And it's your, it's your experience as a developer, which you have noticed when you develop uh, Dumpcat library. Uh, what was the question about that? No, it's more like uh, you have used your experience as a, as yeah. a developer, secure code, and invested that into the dot code library. Yeah, I guess. How yeah. do you how do you work with that? You have to be more. It's more than you that develop the code for for dot code. How do you uh, cooperate with others? How do you make sure that the people you work with also? Work the code? annoying thing is that so far they have well for some reason. Very few people want to develop IMAP server fun. <laughs> 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 I have had very little, very little uh, vol volunteers developing Dalkat. And there's of course, well, Stefan Bosch, nowadays it's me and Stefan Bosch, we do pretty much most of the development. Of course, we are, my company, everything is looking much better currently. I think we will hire a couple of new coders maybe in January. So I don't know. We'll see how well it's going to come. But um, I think important thing anyway will still be that I still have to review everyone's code and see that they are writing everything securely. And well, yeah, I don't know. I guess the still main idea is that to try to kind of keep everything, well, yeah, everything as easy to do as possible. Well, yeah, easiness is security, I guess, is my point of view. Okay. I have a, um, so if you're thinking, if you're looking for encryption security related work you can do in Dubcut that might be useful, um, one thing that you could do as a variant on what you're talking about is instead of encrypting the email using some sort of symmetric mechanism whereby you can give the user a decrypted mail, take a public key, encrypt the email in such a way that you can't decrypt it again, and give the user encrypted mail when he downloads it. Then he has, his mail client will have to decrypt the email using his private key. You can store, that way you can store all of the data at rest. You can have a lot of the storage benefits without it being in any way synchronized. <coughs> And you can even do this, so if we assume cooperation from the client, this is one of the dialogues I want to get going with people developing this software, is if you assume cooperation with the client, then you can even encrypt the mail headers. So you can store a blob that, store a blob that is just completely opaque and unreadable once you're done filing it away to the right place. And not until it's downloaded by the, a client that knows how to decrypt it will the information, including the header metadata, be revealed again. And this is actually relatively easy to do. It just requires that we work together. One problem with IMAP protocol, you need to have those some of those header informations in plain text. If that's not available, then uh, then when the client tries to download a, some list of headers, it only will see some, I don't know, the date of the email will be corrupt. So this, this, so this is the thing. If we go yeah. through, if we go yeah. through and figure out what is the bare minimum you need to keep in clear text, yeah. you could extract that out to an envelope header and yeah. store everything else. Store the in original message in its entirety, completely encrypted, using a public key that you don't have the access to decrypt again. Yeah. Um, well, and related to some of these things, uh, I know there's also se several couple of projects going on so that. The plan is to kind of put all these public key informations into DNS, I think, so that 
based on the email address, you could do a DNS lookup and get the person's PGP or SMI mm -hmm. public key. Yeah. Well, in this case, I'm assuming you have a relationship with the owner of the mailbox, and it's one of the yeah, things yeah, that yeah, you can yeah. configure yeah. what the yeah. public key is. Yeah, that could be useful, but yeah. I don't really, yeah, <laughs> better than nothing, but it's still kind of something, I don't. I think that would be kind of difficult to bring to the mass users. <laughs> it requires that they run clients that will be able to decrypt. Yeah. And there's no way around that if you want to get end-to-end -end security. Yeah, and it kind of requires that the user actually cares about enough security. And it still seems like most people are just happy with the Gmail and yes. other way mail. Is the IMA protocol kind of an obstacle to get the secure email in this way? Should it be better with a new protocol with the security of the team from the start? Yeah, I, I don't think IMA protocol really is a problem with it. Um, <coughs> well, SMTP protocol is more problematic because, because uh, SM, there's so many different broken SMTP servers all around the world. And at least the IMAP servers, well, they're relatively good, I guess. <laughs> uh, but I've, I've been thinking also about different protocol replacing IMAP, like some HTTP-based protocol that might be nice. Uh, but that I don't really see ways to make it more or allow more security. Maybe, that, maybe it might be useful to have some kind of PGP or S9 inter, um, interfacing or something in the new protocol, but I haven't really thought about it. Yeah. Actually, so we also had um, in our, our uh, community someone who was thinking about creating like a REST um, interface to, to the entire Colab server, right, including email and everything. So then you have your HTTP access layer. Um, but the point is uh, that we dis we discussed it in, in, at one of the KDE PIM sprints, and um, the, there remained very little advantage over the current protocol. Because the pro so, so his, his ultimate, um, I mean, he started out from the premise that HTTP was somehow simpler than IMAP, which actually it is not. Um, um, and so it ended up at, um, at, oh, but then you have persistent URLs, but there's an IMAP RFC that gives you persistent URLs as well. So, I mean, you know, at the end of the day, there was no benefit left um, after we had cracked at this with a group full of uh, very, very, um, HTTP, IMAP, SMTP heavy people who've been developing this kind of software for 15 years. So um, we just figured it's probably not actually really worth the effort. Yeah, it's uh, a lot of people think that IMAP protocol is making is the reason why things are slow. But yeah, no. Uh, there's a couple of benefits I think for the HTTP protocol. But one of the easy ones is that okay, it's much easier to access. Create some client or create software that accesses uh, emails through HTTP than it is for them to create an IMAP library that parses the very complicated IMAP rules. And then the other one that actually might benefit in some ways is if you store the attachments separately. And then you could kind of have a separate, completely separate attachment server so that the complex stuff is happening in this whatever server, and then the attachments are in completely different place, like it could be using CDNs or anything, so that the emails could be downloaded just using HTTP, or the attachments could be downloaded from, I don't know, Akamai caches and whatever <laughs> might be useful. Yeah, the duplication of, um, of ACLs is always a dangerous thing to do, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Because um, ACLs are the one thing you really want to rely upon. Um, and replicating them is a tricky business. Um, so you have two systems that can break instead of one system that could break. Um, so difficult. Okay. Yes, there's another. Um, no, I'm right. Oh, okay. Okay. I'll help you know, hanging around here still. So if you have something in your mind, let's stop that question. <laughs> Okay, uh, then we have one more presentation. Let's have like a 10 minute.